No, Jessica, it's, it's a, a great um, honour and pleasure to see Jessica again. We met probably about eight or nine years ago at uh, an event in Cardiff. Cardiff is in Wales, that's the country to the left of England for people. And Jessica had just won some sort of IET award for best grooviest student of the year or something like that. Like that yeah. and, uh, and then we've met a couple of times since at various, we've done some radio shows and things like that together. But the burning question is at the time she won this IET award and, um, and you didn't get your prize, did you? Did you ever get the prize? No, I didn't. See, IET, I didn't. bunch of bastards. See? Right. Uh, <laughs> stick, stick with us at IFSI. We always honour our pledges. So, uh, so uh, we, we've kind of been in touch ever since, and it's been, uh, it's been sickening to watch uh, Jessica's career over the last uh, few years, to be quite honest. Normally, I memorise all the things that people have done, but it's, it's actually impossible in Jessica's case. So I'll just read out some of the highlights, most of which I don't even know what they mean. Okay? So Jessica graduated in 2015, six years ago. And since then, she's become, um, like I say, I hesitate to read things off a list, but you'll see why in a moment. She's a Royal Academy uh, visiting professor, uh, and also, this is the first thing I don't know what it means, Royal Society Entrepreneur in Residence at the University of Wales, Trinity St. David's. I'm not in, sure what it means either. Hey, what the <laughs> hell? You get the, uh, you get the letters after your name, don't you, in the title, but there we go. Um, She's, she's a non-executive director for the Institute of Apprenticeships and Technical Education. I kind of get that. The vice chair of Wales', of Wales largest exam board, uh, W.E. Jake, which I get because my kids have all been through that kind of thing. She is the Woman Spire 2020 Board Member of the Year. I don't know what that is. Um, I'm not sure if men are allowed to know what that is, but there we go. <laughs> uh, now, this is the one. She's got the freedom of the City of London, which is, I think they've just done that to annoy you being Welsh, haven't they? Because knowing well, that you'll never, ever take that up. True, although I can now drive my sheep across the bridge and beat my what? apprentices. Uh, beat your a apprentices? very, very useful Excellent. thing to know. Well, yeah. don't confuse the two. Don't <laughs> drive your apprentices over the bridge and beat your sheep. So, uh, <laughs> could be worse, could be monkeys. Uh, she's also, she's, uh, she's got the rank, now this is the thing, I've got no idea what this means, liveryman at the Worshipful Company of Scientific Instrument Makers. That's that fur, fur cloak, cloak stuff. That's, yeah. uh, that, that, that's really, <laughs> she's also, uh, another minor thing, she's also an MBE, uh, she made it as the, uh, on the 2020 Who's Who's list of influential British people, which includes the Welsh, and appeared as one of the youngest in the Forbes 30 under 30s Europe list. I could go on, but um, I, think, I think we get the impression. It's an absolute delight to see you here today, Jessica. So with, uh, without any further ado, can we all just please show our appreciation to Jessica? So, thank you, John. I'm, I'm going to try and be on my best behaviour today because I arrived a little bit late, as you've probably gathered. I'll be honest, it was quite a stressful journey up. Um, I do come from a place called Wales. I don't think I've ever travelled this far north before, so it's, uh, it's an interesting experience. I hope you can understand me clearly. <laughs> um, but no, you know, I, I think I caused some panic within the events team because I was uh, sort of 20 minutes late this morning. So I don't think I've ever arrived at an event and had a cup of tea waiting for me. So uh, so. Thank you very, very much for that. So it seems like it's a really, really exciting time to be joining you. Um, I've known John for more than a decade, and I don't think I've ever been able to explain what Incozy meant. So uh, I think a move to the Institute for Systems Engineering is certainly a good one. And you've got my vote, not that it counts, unfortunately. But anyway, today I want to talk to you about something a little bit different, I suppose, something that I've been involved with since the early part of my career and something that I'm really trying to sort of pioneer in my, in my new business. So let's see how we go. Anyone heard of the term entrepreneurship? Show of hands. Cool, okay. That's more than I usually get. I'll take that. Fantastic, I've got some sort of clicker here. I put a timer on as well because I do have a habit of talking for too long. Okay, so let me set the scene. So when we entered this global pandemic, what was it, almost two years ago, governments were fearing mass unemployment, right? We were, you know, we had, we had furlough introduced to kind of keep people in jobs. We had the kickstart scheme introduced, uh, which my company has benefited from uh, extremely well, as I'm sure many others have, uh, to try and get young people back into work or into their first jobs, because we were really fearing that, that kind of young people were going to be seriously affected by the unemployment situation. What nobody anticipated, at least to my knowledge, is that we would end up with a shortage of fruit pickers 
HGV drivers, hospitality workers, and more recently, software engineers, because we're now realizing that software uh, is a thing that exists outside of the tech industry as well. Uh, in, a, in another one of my roles, I'm chair of the Centre for Digital Public Services in Wales, and it's really interesting to see uh, how governments and public services, public sector organisations are really kind of embracing this digital change. And I think a lot of that has to do with the pandemic. So, let me set the scene. We've got a very, very tight labour market, which is not a position that we expected to be in coming out of a pandemic, being in what is being considered as a recession. So we've got, I think, the, the most recent stat that I saw, 2 million unfilled UK job vacancies. Now, I'm not going to get into the politics of Brexit, but some of that might have to do with the fact that it's very, very difficult to bring people over to fill some of these jobs as well. On top of that, what COVID has really accelerated, and you know, I, I don't want to play down the, the kind of negative impacts of COVID, but one of the really good things that's come out of it is this kind of work from anywhere movement. So the impact of remote and digital working. My organization is a digitally native company, so we've got no physical business premise. We employ people all around the UK. Uh, it's really quite interesting as a small company having that sort of digital presence and a lack of physical presence really enables you to scale quite quickly because you can keep your overheads quite low. So that's really new. And, and the UK is a little bit behind on this, right? Because countries like Greece are setting up their stall and saying, you know, here's a digital nomad visa. I don't, I think digital nomad's probably a, a new term for the dictionary this year as well. But this idea that if you come and live in Greece, then you know, we will actually give you some tax incentives so that you can work anywhere from the world, anywhere in the world, as long as you base yourself in Greece. Now, you know, I come from Cardiff, Cardiff versus COS. I know where I'd probably rather be. We've also got this on-demand culture. So I think COVID has really changed, not just the way that we consume, but our expectations of, uh, as, as consumers. So, you know, if I look at the public sector, people expect now that you'll be able to track your NHS appointments on your phone, you know, COVID track and trace, classic example, right? We're all using it and we all expect that kind of joined up service across the board. And then we've got this digital boom. So as I really said at the start, software is not just a thing and digital is, is not just this kind of magical thing that uh, sits within the tech industry. It is everywhere and organizations from the NHS. I was speaking to the NHS just last week and they've got hundreds and hundreds of unfilled digital vacancies in Wales and are now looking at where can we pull people, be them military veterans, be them you know, refugees and migrants, where can we pull people and train them up into these roles? And that's where you're seeing these new kind of, you've got a thing in England called boot camps. We're not doing that in Wales yet. I'm still trying to get that into Wales. Um, but that's where you see in those sorts of initiatives. So we've got this war for digital talent. And the result of all of this, 63% of employers, almost two thirds of employers, are struggling to recruit for specialist roles, many of those being engineering type roles. So in amongst all of this, I decided to co-found a business specializing in technical talent management. So at the time, uh, I worked for Sony, who you've probably heard of. Uh, Sony does have a base in Wales. So I come from an engineering and manufacturing background where I met John. I did my degree in, in astrophysics at Cardiff University and then moved into to Sony pretty quickly after that. And what I found, you know, I, I was responsible for, we called it Industry 4.0. It's a more commonly sort of used term now. But I was responsible for developing these Industry 4.0 technologies. And I managed teams um, initially in the UK, where we were building products that were consumed by other Sony factories globally. Uh, and that was really, really interesting because that was my first taste of entrepreneurship, although I didn't quite know it at the time because we didn't actually use that term. But that was the first time I came across it. And what I found in that role was that we actually didn't pay that well, honestly. So it was really, really difficult to get the kind of talent that I needed uh, even back in sort of 2015, 2016. And so I spend a lot of my time building apprenticeship schemes, building graduate schemes, lobbying Welsh government to get new qualifications added to the framework so that we could give that, that kind of high quality, up-to-date education that we needed to give. And I love my job there, but like many others, I got furloughed 
Um, I spent six months on furlough, getting drunk, enjoying what seemed like a very, very long summer. And like, you know, a lot of other people, I decided that I wanted a little bit more from my career, a little bit more from, from my life, I suppose. And so I took the plunge to create Younger. Uh, now, Yungo, it's always a talking point because people see the word and they go, how do I pronounce that? So, Yungo is a Latin word and it means to connect. So, we kind of see ourselves as the connective tissue between employers, training providers and policymakers. So, trying to kind of join up and I suppose, you know, if I describe what we do, we try and create a line of sight for people. So, we try and give people progression pathways. So, they're not just looking at the next step. They're looking a few steps ahead and they're looking at what options they've got. So we started with this idea of creating a data-driven information advice and guidance platform for schools because, you know, career service leaves a, bit to, a, a little bit to be desired. I can remember my own experience of, a, of the career service. I, I went into my careers advisor when I was 14 and I said, um, I'd really like to be a software engineer. She said, fantastic, get yourself down to the BBC and do some work experience as a news anchor. Don't think she quite understood that. Um, so yeah, so I suppose based on my own experience, based on the experience of, of some of my apprentices and some of my uh, quite junior colleagues, we decided to, to build this careers information advice and guidance platform to help young people who we expected to be kind of most affected by this pandemic, to help them to assess their options, you know, in amongst changing landscapes, changing industries, changing roles, etc. And in the 18 months or so that followed, We've managed to grow a 10x turnover, and we've actually grown our team to 17 people with a 100% retention rate. And that is despite this kind of backdrop. Now, we're not the best payers, we are a startup. So we have to work really, really hard to bring these people in and to give them that career progression and to keep them interested in our business. And the trick that we had, the trick up our sleeve, was fostering an entrepreneurial culture. So that's what I want to talk to you about today. So a few people know what this is. I could ask you to come and just give the rest of the lecture for me. That would be lovely. Um, but I'm going to try and give you my explanation. And, and, and as systems engineers, I was really hoping that you'd kind of appreciate um, this creative diagram that I've put together. This was the best way I could think of to, uh, to explain it. So. Let's start with entrepreneurship, because I think it's something that we're a bit more familiar with. So I would describe entrepreneurship as trying to fly a hot air balloon in space. You've got very, very little resistance. You're on your own. You've got so much freedom, but you've got no resources either, yeah, typically. Um, you know, unless you're Richard Branson or, you know, uh, Tony Blair's son, Ewan Blair, recently uh, got 50 million for, for his kind of startup. It's uh, quite an interesting one, actually, if you've seen that organization called Multiverse. So unless you are kind of from a background where you've got that, you are starting a startup with no resources. But you've got all this freedom, and so you're taking a lot of risk. And you're probably going to have to put some of your own money into it if you've got some, or you might have to take some loans out. Yeah, But the reward is all yours. That's the exciting thing about being an entrepreneur, right? Now, as an entrepreneur, it isn't really about creating a good product. That's the thing that I've learned, because <laughs> we failed really, really badly with our first product. Maybe I'll tell you about that if you, if you ask me later. Um, but it actually isn't about creating a good product. It's about finding product market fit. So it's about navigating markets. And the great thing that you get as an entrepreneur is the opportunity to build your own culture. And for me, that's been the best thing about it, right, is, is creating an environment where we do things a little bit differently. Again, coming from a manufacturing background where people sit and do the same job for eight hours a day, yeah, people put their hands up to go to the toilet. Coming from that kind of background, it was really, really exciting for me to have the opportunity to create my own culture uh, and to do things a little bit differently. Now, what about entrepreneurship? Well, I describe this as trying to blow up a balloon in, in the deep sea, right? You've got plenty of resources, actually, to support you, but you've got this intense organizational pressure, particularly if you're an entrepreneur within a large corporate, which cer certainly I was. So in this situation, your freedom is massively restricted. 
Okay, you generally get given a brief, you know, I was given a brief of we had to make some sort of sensor that could be used in different factories around the globe. Right, okay, no idea what that means, but I'll look into it. And there's certain expectations of success that go with that. And something that, you know, that, that I learned and from other entrepreneurs that I know, generally organizations are um, a little bit averse to failure. So you find yourself spending a lot of time kind of dressing things up so that failures don't look like failures. They, they look like something slightly different, which is always interesting. Um, but here, what you're doing, you've got a route to market, right? Working for an organization like Sony, we already had those established sales channels. So you're not navigating markets this time. You're navigating culture because you've got an existing culture within an organization. So Sony, Japanese organization, there were lots of cultural nuances that we had to navigate in order to get our new ideas through to actually being produced and being consumed by some of those factories. So it's a really, really different situation. Now, you may look at that and go, well, you know, why would you want to be an entrepreneur? Being an entrepreneur sounds a lot more rewarding. But actually, the great thing about being an entrepreneur is it's not your risk that you're taking. You know, the, the worst thing that's going to happen is you might get a demotion. You know, and that generally doesn't happen, to be perfectly honest. Um, so the great thing about being an entrepreneur is that you can get your ideas off the ground really, really quickly with your organization's resources, be that financial resources, you know, they give you a budget, or be that, you know, human resources, people, talent. And so it's a really, really interesting opportunity. And the reason why I bring this up is because for organizations, existing organizations coming out of the pandemic, can't keep doing the same thing for all those reasons that we just mentioned. The way that people consume is changing. People's expectations of a service is changing. And so we have to innovate. We have to be entrepreneurial. And so we have to foster an environment that enables people to do that entrepreneurship without kind of feeling all of that pressure. So it's trying to find that middle ground, you know, that middle ground being giving people the space to, to have vision, to exercise their creativity. You know, creativity is their top skill that all employers are going to be looking for by 2025. We could do a presentation on that in itself, but we'll leave it for another time. But giving people space to be creative, allowing people to fail, so important. Right, learning from the entrepreneurship, fail fast, fail forward. Yeah, learning from those mistakes. Being resilient, being innovative. So that's kind of how I describe it, but you know, very, very happy to get your views on it as well. Now, what are the benefits of it? So, you know, obviously, new products and services. I think you probably expect that from, um, from any kind of enterprising activity. For me, the biggest thing is building your organizational capability because that is what's going to give you your sustainable competitive advantage. And finally, the bit that we all kind of look for is that impact on the bottom line. And you can achieve that. You know, this isn't a kind of fluffy, do nice things for your people. You know, this is a give your people the best environment to work in and they will deliver really, really great things for you as well. And they'll be really loyal. So these are the benefits as I see them. Now I'll tell you a little bit about our organization. I'm going to get rid of that because it's in my way. I'll tell you a little bit about our organization because we are quite new. So when we started, we had this ethos that we wanted to be ethical. We'd seen lots of untoward practices, you know, intentionally or, or accidentally within the industries that we came from. And we really wanted to make a stand and say, we want to be a really, really ethical organization. We want to be a collaborative organization. We don't want to be taskmasters, right? We don't want to just give people a list of jobs to do. We want people working together. It's quite hard in a remote environment, by the way. Um, we wanted people to be authentic, you know, going back to the point earlier on diversity. We wanted people to bring their whole selves to work. Um, now, I've got a bit of a thing about diversity. I like to use the term inclusion because my belief is that if you, in, if you create an inclusive environment, you will naturally generate diversity through that, um, and that's worked for us. I won't give you the stats because it's a horrible thing to do in my view, but if you looked at our you know, kind of diversity statistics and our gender pay gap reporting, um, et cetera, you would see that we've got a really, really diverse group of people both on paper, but actually in terms of their, their way of thinking, their experiences, their backgrounds. And that, for me, is so important. So we wanted that authenticity. We wanted to build that into the fabric of how we work. 
And finally, we wanted to develop sector experts. We wanted people to feel empowered and knowledgeable about their subject. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that later, because that, that's been something that's really, really worked for us in terms of crafting this entrepreneurial structure. So the first thing we did was be really, really deliberate around the way we recruit people. So we do not recruit based on qualifications or experience. I'm going to be a little bit unpopular for saying this, but we would not recruit somebody because they were a chartered engineer. Lots of organisations do, but we don't. And the reason being is that we wanted to adopt a AAA criteria. I mean, we, we were looking at the state of the labour market, right, and going, realistically, we're a small organisation, we can't pay a lot, how are we going to get the best people? And the best people aren't necessarily the ones with the best qualifications. So we came up with this philosophy called AAA. So it's attitude, aptitude, ambition, in that order, okay? So the attitude is around, can I work with you? Are you going to fit into our team? Have you got something about you? that you can bring to, to the team. Aptitude, can I teach you what you need to know? Yeah? Knowledge can be learned, skills can be gained. And if you've got an individual that has the, the potential to kind of take on that knowledge and that, those skills, then you're probably one for my team. And then finally, ambition. And ambition is critical because I've managed a lot of graduates <laughs> and some of them have ambitions way above what we could ever provide. And so we have to be realistic. We want people who are going to be ambitious in terms of what we're offering and wanting to drive our business forward. But equally, we don't want to hold people back if actually they want things that we can't deliver. So it's about being realistic and it's about holding a mirror up in that sense as well. So AAA criteria. Now, the other thing that we did, and we we're actually working on a project with an organization called Cluster. So it's like Cluster, but with two Ws, it's a Welsh thing. Um, so we're working with an organization called Cluster on um, sort of the recruitment process in the creative industries for neurodiverse people. And what we found is that if you craft um, a sort of job application experience around a neurodiverse person, you don't disadvantage a neurotypical person. Okay, so in employment law, we've got this horrible thing around making reasonable adjustments and it makes people feel like, you know, they're a bit of a, you know, bit of a nuisance really I have to make a reasonable adjustment for me actually if you just design your recruitment process to be inclusive from the start um, then you don't need to make those reasonable adjustments and you're not disadvantaging anybody so we kind of pioneered this approach internally uh, just as a kind of proof of concept and what we did with our application form is we made it really really short we didn't ask about qualifications we didn't ask about experience we asked three questions and I'm going to try and remember what they are why younger? Why do you want to work with us? What is it about us that you like? Because if you're going to go and work for a startup, you need to be sure that that's an organization you want to be part of. It's pretty intense, right? It's got its own kind of culture. So we asked them, why younger? We asked them, who are you? <laughs> what do you want? And tell us anything you want about you. So some people uploaded a CV, as would be expected. Yeah? Some people made a video clip. Some people made a soundbite. And we just accepted any kind of format. We just said, tell us a bit about you. Tell us what you think we should know. And then the third question was, what's your value proposition? What can you offer us? And again, some people uploaded a covering letter. But you'd be surprised how many people uploaded a, a portfolio, you know, or a, a kind of video of, you know, I've looked at your website, I've seen what you do, I'm really passionate about helping young people get into careers and this is how I'm going to help you. So it was really interesting to see the creativity that came from those applications. And, you know, in, in my view, it was a much more efficient application process because we weren't reading through, you know, hundreds and hundreds of pages of applications. But we also didn't disadvantage anyone. So that's worked really, really well for us. And when we have clients come to us and say, you know, we're really, really struggling to recruit, the first thing we do is look at that actual recruitment process and see if there's any barriers within it. Because you can really simplify it and still get really, really good people. So that's how we do our kind of recruitment. Sorry for the acronyms. I realize you probably get way too many acronyms on these conferences. So for, for anybody not familiar, human resource management. Um, so this was a really interesting one for us. So I did a, <laughs> I did a diploma in uh, human resource management randomly uh, after doing a degree in astrophysics. I know it doesn't quite fit. Um, but I realized that, you know, I didn't have the 
the capabilities, I suppose, the competencies, the experience to, to be a good manager. And I, I was worried about getting it wrong. Uh, and I was worried about, from a legal perspective, getting it wrong as well. So, so I did a, a diploma in human resource management a few years ago. And it was really interesting because when you're setting up a new business, having that kind of knowledge helps you to formalise um, some of your thinking around how you manage people, you know, almost as a systems approach to managing people within an organisation. So we very deliberately said we want to do things differently. We don't want to force people to come into an office. We don't care how many hours people work, as long as they're not overworking, something called the working time regulations, which means that people shouldn't really work more than 48 hours. We never want to put people in a position where they were working too much. But actually, if they're contracted for 30 hours and they're doing 25 and still getting their work done, you know, why would we care about that? So we took this really, really deliberate approach to say, we want to be remote because we want to recruit, we want to fish from a, from a big pool. Um, but we want to be really, really flexible. So my first employee starts his shift, and I'm serious now, at about two in the morning. And he lives in Wales, and we're in the same time zone. Um, and that's when he starts his shift, because that's just when he likes to work. That's when he's most creative. And I don't have a problem with that. I mean, sometimes I have to force him to get up, you know, whilst it's still light to come to a meeting or something. But on the whole, if that's when he wants to work, that's not a problem for me, as long as we've got that good communication. So it was a really, really interesting challenge because we had to rewrite contracts in a way that employment law really wasn't ready for, <laughs> right? And probably still isn't. Um, because if you know anything about writing contracts, they rely on three things, right? It's um, number of hours worked for rate of pay at place. Well, we kind of don't have two of those things, right? Because <laughs> we're not so bothered about how many hours people work and we don't really care where they work. They can work from anywhere. They could work from a different country if the UK government sorted out its tax position on that. But that's another story. Um, so it was really, really interesting for us to work within the constraints of employment law to set up these quite new contracts. And I am a firm believer that we are going to see more and more organisations setting up in this fashion. And eventually, employment law is going to have to change. Because for anyone who's studied scientific management theory, anyone who's worked in manufacturing, you will know that these contracts, employment law, comes from that period, yeah, where people did turn up to work and do the same task every day for eight hours. It doesn't work like that anymore. We're not robots. Yeah? So HRM, really, really interesting process. And we're still trying to get it right. Uh, and we're still kind of adapting those contracts and, and trying to make them, you know, what, what we don't want to do because we could have easily treated people as contractors. And that's probably a question that's going through some people's minds is why didn't you just treat them as contractors? Um, IR35 hasn't hit small organisations yet, so we probably could have done that. But we didn't want to because we wanted to give people holidays. We wanted to give people pensions because we felt it was a, the right thing to do. Um, so it's, it's a really interesting process, and I, I do believe that employment law is going to change as a result. Well-being and mental health. I cannot stress how important this is, whether you're remote or physical or blended. It really doesn't matter. The great thing about the pandemic is it's brought some of these issues to the forefront, right? So we are now, for the first time, talking about mental health without it being a little bit of a stigma, in most cases anyway. And so we took on a lady recently, um, you know, fresh graduate, sociology degree, really, really interesting, always concerned she's psychoanalyzing me every time we have a conversation, uh, really, really clever girl. We took her on through Kickstart, yeah? So believe, unbelievably, we've taken on six um, Kickstarters. So these are 16 to 24 year olds who, have really limited employment prospects, and all six of those have been really, really high-flying graduates. One had a first degree, uh, sorry, master's degree um, in physics from Manchester. We didn't take them on because they were graduates. We didn't even look at their qualifications. It just so happened they were. So it's amazing how kind of unbalanced that talent pool is at the moment as well. But anyway, we, we took this lady on ploy who um, straight away came to our meetings and said, this, this isn't quite right. These meetings are awkward. Right? And I said, well, of course they're awkward. You've got a bunch of introverts sitting in a virtual meeting room and they don't know what to say to each other unless they've got an agenda in front of them. So um, she came to these meetings and she said, right, we need to do something about this. What is it that we've all got in common? And, you know, unfortunately, I'm not in this category, but apparently everybody else in the organisation likes to game, right? I mean, the only game I've ever played is like Sims and that was, you know, a very long time ago. So I don't think that counts. Um, so she's doing a virtual gaming night. 
And it's a really, really interesting thing to watch because she's brought all of these, and it, you know, as I say, we're, we're employing 17 people, 16 of which are, are introverted. You can guess who the, the non-introvert is. Um, but it's really interesting because she's brought all of these people together into a kind of virtual social environment. Bear in mind, most of these people have never met each other, right? We've got employees in Scotland, in North London, in Maidstone, in Gloucester, and a few dotted around in Wales as well, and most of them have never met. And she's bringing them together and doing these kind of competitive virtual games. So it's, it's been really, really interesting, and I think the impact that we've seen in our employee engagement surveys, we run them three times a week, so we've always got our finger on the pulse. The impact that we have seen is that people are just a bit more comfortable in work, you know, and that the, the impact of being a little bit more comfortable and a little bit happier in work means that we get much better collaboration. You know, people actually talk to each other a lot more. I'm going to have to speed up because I ain't going to get through all this at this rate. Apologies. Um, HRD, human resource development. Um, so this is, this is the, the key bit in the next 15 minutes I'm going to focus on with you. So... Lifelong learning, term that's being bandied around quite a bit at the moment. Our entire business is based off the premise that everyone is an apprentice. Yeah, and that doesn't mean we're paying £4.30 an hour, I can assure you. Um, we are a living wage employer. Um, but it's, it's based off that premise that everyone is an apprentice because we've all got things to learn. And we've taken graduates and put them on apprenticeships in social media, in artificial intelligence, in creative and user-centered design. Even, you know, my, my co-founder and myself, you know, we're, we're also doing um, sort of training at the moment. I'm doing my MBA and for some reason, he's already got about three degrees, but he's doing a degree in maths and economics. Why he'd put himself through that, I don't know. Um, but anyway, so our entire kind of business premise is around this idea that we're constantly learning and evolving our organizational capability. So, types of entrepreneurs. And this goes back to basic kind of management theory, I suppose. You get assigned entrepreneurs. So I was an assigned entrepreneur in Sony. I was given responsibility and a budget and a team and told, you know, go and build this product and do this thing. Um, and, and it can work. You know, what do you get from that? You get power, you get control, you get status. Um, but the much more powerful type of entrepreneur is that emergent entrepreneur, the ones who feel empowered to come forward with new kind of ideas and new concepts. They're the really powerful ones, the ones that can influence their peers because they've got an energy about them, because they feel, you know, kind of motivated and empowered at work. And they've got a level of self-awareness. They know the constraints because even in an organization of our size, people still have to navigate our culture, right? So you've got to help your entrepreneurs to do that. And this is how we do it. So you know, a little bit of theory, a lot of you have probably come across this, Daniel Pink's Autonomy Mastery Purpose. Yeah. So this is a really, really nice, it's a simple framework, but for me, everybody is on a, is on a sliding scale with this, right? So everybody has some level of need for autonomy. In me, it's very, very high. That's why I set up my own business, because I wanted to be my own boss. I wanted to take control, and I wanted to be responsible for it if I was successful or if I failed. For other people, you know, interestingly, particularly graduates that we've had coming in, they don't want much autonomy. They're afraid of getting things wrong. They actually want more structure, which has been interesting for us because we try and be really, really flexible. Um, so it does vary in different people, but there's the autonomy, the mastery, so that idea of getting really, really good at something, being that sector expert. I said that at the start. We set up, you know, <laughs> our first employee, Mason, who I, who I mentioned earlier, the one that works at two in the morning, so previously, he worked at Sony. That's how I met him. And um, he repaired circuit boards day in, day out. And I remember meeting this guy. I took over um, his team, and I kind of inherited him. And I remember meeting him, and he, he was a funny character. He didn't say much. Um, I, you know, he didn't, didn't look me in the eye. He didn't, didn't speak much to me at all. And um, I watched him work, and he seemed quite lazy, right? He'd be swinging on his chair. He'd be sort of, um, they, they used to do this really annoying thing of getting pictures of people and printing them on little stickers and then sticking them everywhere. So my face was all around the factory, which was really quite annoying. Um, <laughs> so he never seemed to do much work. But when I looked at his figures, you know, his output, he was outputting like 10 times what everyone else was doing. And I was thinking, how is, it, how is he doing it? There's something about this guy. And I spent a little bit of time just kind of studying him. And I started challenging him. I said, oh, you know, Mason, we've got this real problem. 
um, you know, around kind of quality control. We, we're not getting the figures on time. I've got to do all this data processing. And he went away and built this database within two weeks. Didn't even say he was doing it. Built this database, which we sponsored because it was so good. Uh, we were working off a Microsoft <laughs> Access database. And as you can imagine, you know, it, it was frustrating to say the least and, and painful in terms of crunching your data. And within two weeks, he built this entire system. And we were, you know, taken aback, but not surprised, I suppose, because you could tell he had a little something about him. So we sponsored him. We took him out of his role for 50% of his time, and we gave him a little bit of space and a little bit of encouragement to actually drive this forward. We put him in touch with a couple of people from the IT department, and he built a system that's still operational in Sony today. Um, obviously, when I got furloughed and we set up this business, straight away we, uh, we poached him. So uh, I'm probably not too popular for that. But we put him on an apprenticeship. So his background was in, was in electronic repair, but he was a gamer. He enjoyed coding in his bedroom in his spare time. And so we put him on a degree apprenticeship in software engineering. He's now our most senior employee. And, um, and I think for, for Mason, it's all about that mastery. Yeah? He likes the autonomy as well, for sure. But it's all about that mastery. It's all about building those skills and being the expert in something. And we've given him the kind of freedom to do that. And then for other people, it's more about purpose. And certainly a lot of job applications that we get are from people who are saying, I really buy into what Youngo's doing. I recently, I think this is why we've got so many graduates, actually, because people sort of say, I recently went through the careers system and I know there's problems and I really want to help other young people to get that line of sight in their career. So I really, really recommend this framework. When you're developing your employee value proposition, which we'll talk about a little bit in a second, I really, really recommend tapping into that framework and actually doing a little bit of an assessment on your own staff and saying what motivates them, what drives them, because if you can tap into that, you can unleash that entrepreneurial spirit. Okay, EVP. So this is our employee value proposition. Um, Typically, lots of companies, lots of traditional companies, focus on that bottom part, okay, the contractual. So they focus on having competitive salaries. And you see, you know, how many job adverts you see that say competitive salary, what does that mean? I've got no idea. Particularly in this day and age where you can be living in somewhere in Wales and work for someone in London on, you know, twice the salary. I'm not sure what that means anymore. So a lot of people focus on that contractual stuff. Now, for us, as I say, we're, we're not the best payers currently. So we put in place an employee share scheme. So people are buying into the business literally, yeah? And if we do well, they get rewarded for it financially as well. So the, the contractual bit is there. Then there's the experiential part. So I don't know how good that yellow is, to be honest, but for us, it was about growing with the business. So when we had our first kind of cohort of, of employees coming in, they said, well, you know, I can't see where I'm going in this business. It's a very flat structure. Yeah, it is. But here's the really exciting thing. In our business, you don't have to apply for a promotion. When the next kind of people come in, you naturally grow with the business. Yeah, so as we take on more work, as we get better at what we do, we take on more clients, you just grow. And we'll just keep giving you that space to grow as much as you want. It. So that was our kind of experiential part. A lot of it was around learning, this idea that everybody is an apprentice. And honestly, for me, I think this has been the most successful part of our employee value proposition. It's that employee experience. That's what people want now, particularly post-pandemic. I live by the sea. And it's, it's not even a village, right? It's a hamlet. There's like 50 houses there, something like that. And it's a beautiful place. But pre-pandemic, everyone said to me, I don't know how you can live there. It's just too secluded. You're like 20 minutes away from like any kind of civilization. And it suits me because I, you know, I kind of like my own space. But it really wasn't a desirable place to be, even though it was beautiful. Post-pandemic, I got estate agents knocking on my door all the time. Do you want to sell your house? <laughs> So the way that the, the, the things that people value and the way that people live has changed dramatically post-pandemic. And honestly, yeah, people want a good salary, but they're more interested in having a good work-life balance most of the time. So that middle tier, that experiential part of your EVP is absolutely critical to retaining your staff if you are good payers, because that isn't enough anymore. In the war for talent, they're just going to keep moving to the next best payer unless you can offer them something bigger, something more meaningful. And it's also critical for, for recruiting, uh, particularly if you're a fairly small, unknown company. 
And then finally, that emotional tier at the top as well. So, you know, for us, it was around come and shape the future of our business. Yeah. Um, come and create a culture of lifelong learning within South Wales. Help us upskill the, the, the Welsh economy. So it's, 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 again, tapping into that Daniel Pink's autonomy mastery purpose, giving people an emotional connection to your business. I'm going to move over that. So how can you reward entrepreneurship? <clears throat> Here's a few ideas for you. Things called idea accelerators. So Sony was really, really good at this globally. Um, we were a big kind of matrix structure. And we had this program called SAP, Sony Accelerator Program, or Seed Accelerator Program, or something. And basically, anybody from any position in the business could propose an idea, and they'd get to go on a boot camp. So they'd have a day, you know, off-site, uh, visiting a, you know, wherever it was. I think I went to Basingstoke when I did it. Um, <laughs> yeah, you were all expecting me to say Tokyo or something, weren't you? I know, Basingstoke, unfortunately. If you got to the next level, you did get to go to Tokyo, though. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so, you know, you get to put forward the idea, you go to one of these camps, they teach you some, you know, methodologies. We actually run courses on this if anybody's interested, but things like analogy thinking, opposite thinking to help you really kind of flesh that idea out. And if you're successful in your pitching, you get sponsored and you get taken out of your job and given, you know, a year or two years or whatever it is to go and build this new idea. So idea accelerators, great for large companies. So if you're working for a big company, you want to bring some entrepreneurial spirit in, it's a really, really good way to do it. Hackathons, you probably all know what they are. But again, maybe having a predefined problem, getting people into a room. It doesn't have to be software-based. It's a bit of a software term. But actually, I've seen lots of public service, NHS-type organizations doing this as well. So it doesn't have to be software-focused. It's just about collaborative problem solving. Innovation time, something that Google pioneered. So this idea that you give people 20% of their time, so a day a week to go and work on something, maybe a little bit random, a loose connection to their work. That's where Google Maps came from. That's where um, Google Books came from, I believe, as well. So that's quite a, an interesting one. Interestingly, I don't think Google do it anymore. So that may tell you that there's a bit of a, you know, a critical mass where these things kind of stop working and you have to try something else. Um, but certainly an interesting one to experiment with. And then the sandbox fund, and I'm not sure how I feel about this, but it's the idea that, you know, you almost get given credits, so it's like gamifying the experience, and you can spend those credits on other people's time to assemble a team to help you, or you can spend them on holidays if you want to, so it's, it's interesting. As I say, I'm not quite sure how I feel about that one, but I haven't tried it yet. So there's a few ideas of how you can kind of incentivize and, and reward it. The other thing that, that I wanted to mention is this idea of micro-credential learning. I'm not sure if that's a term used in England. There could be a different term for it, but essentially it's this idea of rather than putting people on, you know, a three-year degree program, let them build up these micro-credentials, let them work on short, sharp learning interventions, maybe something in AI, something in machine learning, and you can almost build them up into something that gets accredited. And I think that's really powerful because... For you as, a, as, a, as an employer, you're developing the capability of your staff a lot quicker than you would with a formal qualification. But for the individual, they're getting something out of it that they can put on their CV as well if they're still using CVs. Um, so I think that's quite an interesting one. So a little bit on us, just briefly. So this, this idea, I said that, that everybody is an apprentice. I mentioned Tom as my co-founder. You might have seen him hobbling around. He's on crutches, part of the reason why we were a little bit late this morning. Um, so Tom's currently doing his, I think, third degree in um, mathematics and economics. So we're really trying to push this top down. Mason, I mentioned him already. There he is, um, my top man. We've also got a guy called Bradley Tanner. So Bradley was a curriculum director at Further Education College. Um, and he, he left the college, set up his own business. So he's what we call a kind of portfolio career person. He does a bit of work with us as our training and development manager but also work for his own business. And we sponsored Brad through his chartered manager because that's what he wanted to do. He felt that was important. So we supported him to kind of pull the evidence together and, you know, put the kind of support in to do that. And he's also done his um, Six Sigma black belt since he's been with us as well, again, because it's something he wanted to do. Great. And then on the portfolio side, so, so this lady, Simi, she was really interesting, right? Because she came to us on a kickstart position initially. And she wanted to be a social media manager. So we gave her a job as a social media manager. And she did really, really well for the first kind of couple of months. And then productivity just dropped off a cliff. 
She wasn't turning up to meetings. We couldn't get hold of her. It, you know, we were really getting a little bit concerned about her. And so we did a sort of performance appraisal and, you know, sat down with her, had a few conversations with her. Myself and Tom spoke to her one-to-one -one as well. And we found out she just really hated doing social media. <laughs> it's fair enough. I don't think I'd want to do it all day either. So we kind of looked at her skills and we found that she was really good at video production. Wow. You know, that's not a skill you come by easily. She was really, she actually produced her own music in her spare time. Um, and was exceptionally good at it. She, she's got a voice for radio, you know, you know, like the, the kind of people who announce, you know, the trains arrive. It, 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 she just perfect, you know, just uh, fantastic. So, so we changed her role completely. We put her on some training in user-centered design and um, we moved her into a creative and design role. And uh, she produces sort of teaser videos for us. She narrates our platform, um, not in Welsh. We have to use somebody else for that, but she narrates it in English for us um, and she's also got this this other career which we're supporting her with as a kind of freelance music artist and that's something I really wanted to get across as well because when I was in employment my employers generally were quite anti-second job yeah and there were all sorts of clauses in the contract around you work for us yeah you do not work for anybody else and I kind of look at that and go well so what if they want to work for someone else? I mean, maybe they're going to develop new skills. They're going to benefit us. As long as there's no material conflict of interest, then so what? So we've actually started putting masterclasses on to really help people um, to build those career portfolios. So even teaching them how to do invoices and things, um, helping them work out how much they can charge for their services. So we really kind of encourage that. And I think that's another reason why we've been able to, to retain people. So I'm probably going to have to, to finish it in a second um, in the interest of time, but I'll just leave you, I suppose, with a couple of structures um, that you can try and implement if, if you want to, depending on your organisation. So in a very hierarchical structure, um, I worked for a company called Maplin Electronics. A few people probably remember that. I'm not the reason it went bust, I promise. Um, so I worked for a company called Maplin Electronics, and again, I didn't know I was an entrepreneur. But I actually approached the CEO. I was only 17, right? So I was a bit sort of bullshit at the time. I approached him and I said, look, I work in your shop part-time in Cardiff. Um, and I've got this idea to make this, you know, uh, uterine contraction monitor. And I wondered if he wanted to give me some money to patent it. And surprisingly, he, um, he called me and he, and he said, you know, yes, I'll fund it for you, which was, that's another story. Um, and he asked if I go and work for him. And essentially, I became part of this. I, I was his... Um, Research and, research and development consultant, I think. But I basically became um, that sort of red column there where I was working with a team of people who were non-operational, but we were working at board level. So we were working with the board to develop new ideas. Um, we were actually sort of part of the movement to bring Raspberry Pi into Maplin, which was weird for me because when I went to Sony, I don't know if you know this, but the, the Sony factory in Wales actually produces the world supply of Raspberry Pi. So that was another kind of really interesting career move for me. Um, but if you are a hierarchical organization, you can kind of bring in this chief disruptor um, to, uh, to do your entrepreneurship for you. If you're fortunate to have a flat structure, you're probably already using these kind of agile teams and they're really, really great um, for fostering entrepreneurship. So you're probably quite well set up there. I love this idea of product owner and scrum master. When we used to do boot camps with kind of old project management styles, you have to appoint a team leader. People would always fall out over it because there could only ever be one team leader. But with a product owner and scrum master, you generally find that people are a lot more satisfied. So, you know, the power is a lot more distributed. <clears throat> Matrix structures, so he is the idea accelerator I was telling you about. So generally, it's a top-level sponsored initiative, which wherever you are in the organization, you can kind of pitch an idea to it and, and get elevated to, to, to work on that initiative. Now, this is my first. Has anyone ever seen an organizational structure like this? No, I know. Brilliant, isn't it? So this is something by McKinsey. Um, it's called an organism structure, and I love it. I love this idea of um, graduates hate ambiguity, by the way. We struggle with this all the time with our graduates. They, they like very clearly defined processes, and I'm a lot more kind of fluid. Um, but this idea that, you know, you've got these kind of specialist teams that just kind of 
revolve around and work together in this creative mist is probably the best way that I can describe it. I'll put it into to practice for you quickly. So here's our creative communications team. And as you'll see from our creative communications team, there's an overlap between all the roles, really, really important um, because you want people to, to lead in human resources or to lead in sales, but to still know a bit about the other, the other pieces as well. So there's our creative comms team. There's our creative technology team. Um, so again, product platform and design. So you, so you want a little bit of overlap so that if things go wrong, you've got other people to, to kind of support. And then our solutions team kind of sits in the middle there. So these are our actual products and services that go out to the market. So that's how we implement this kind of organism structure. I thought you might appreciate this more than other audiences because, you know, you're systems engineers, right? Um, <laughs> So yeah, just, just to finish really, so, so we do this sprint and glide thing. So we have people in this structure, um, which is really nice, really interesting actually, whenever we apply for grants and I have to submit an org chart, I have to have obviously a much more uh, traditional looking org chart to go with it because I did submit this to Welsh Gov once and they rejected it straight away. That's not an org chart apparently, but it is honestly, uh, this is an organism chart. So, um, so sprint and glide, really, really interesting way of working. So getting people doing two weeks, really intense, high sense of urgency work. Um, and then a week basically doing training, you know, chilling out, reflecting on performance, preparing for the following week. So that's worked well. Um, cross functionality, critical. You can see it's embedded into our structure. I think that's how we're working to the, to the kind of productivity levels we are at the moment because we're not narrowing people too much. Um, multidisciplinary teams, again, all about that collaboration. Um, I, I've had some feedback recently. We have too many meetings. And I think, honestly, you think you've got too many meetings? You want to see my diary, right? I got too many meetings. But when I've sort of listened to people, the whole kind of virtual thing is, is difficult because every time you go on a Zoom call, you feel like you're in a meeting and you get meeting fatigue, obviously, you know, from sitting there kind of eight hours a day. So we've tried to create this distinction between formal meetings, which have an agenda and have, you know, a purpose and outcomes, and these cooler chats, which is essentially trying to recreate what you get in a physical organization, where you just go and, you know, ha and, and for me, you know, when I was in Sony, that's where the best ideas happen. So it's trying to create that environment where people can just the, cre the creative tech team do it really well. I think it's because they're all introverts, but they all sit on a call together and don't say anything, which I find really awkward. But it works really well for them because when they want some advice on something, they just unmute and go, you know, can I get your thoughts on this? Um, so, yeah, and, and the way you measure as well. So it's all about value creation, giving people exposure to all of the business functions so they've got a more holistic understanding when they're coming up with ideas and measuring that impact. So it's not about, you know, how long you spend in the office or how many hours you work. It's about the value that you're creating. So I'm going to leave it there because I know I'm over. Apologies, John. Um, but thank you very, very much for your time. And um, yeah, happy to catch up with you all during the conference. Have a great day. OK, well, thanks very much, Jess, for, for that. that. That was absolutely brilliant. Oh, don't go anywhere, don't go anywhere. Uh, people don't mind, can we, we've got time for maybe two quick questions, if people don't mind going over for a few minutes, but I'm sure there are many, many, you've certainly given us a lot to think about there. So any quick questions from the audience? Um, so let's have a see who's there. I'm going to regret this. Richard? Quick one. On the mental well-being, is there any danger of not getting the benefit of physical face-to-face -face meetings? Yes, for sure. Um, and this is something that I think we've found more as we've grown. I think you do hit a critical mass where you have to do something. So what we're experimenting with at the moment is remote working hubs. So because we've got people, we've got a couple of people in London area, a couple of people in Scotland, a couple of people in Wales, we're looking at creating hubs, physical hubs, so um, sort of hot desk in spaces at incubation centres where they can go. And even if they're not meeting with people from our team, at least they've got some feeling of normality. So I think that's, that's one way of doing it. The other thing that we do is whenever we've got an event, and we do a lot of them, um, we try and use it as an opportunity to bring a couple of people together. Um, so yes, th there is. Um, and I would you know, absolutely say what we do is really, really interesting, but you have to look at your own people as well because some people need more kind of social interaction than others. Um, but those are some of the ways that we're trying to address that. Thank you. Okay. Good question. Uh, time for one more very quick one. Uh, right at the back, Neil, is that you I can see? Yeah. Yep.
Mm. So it's a really good question, actually. I think it's a really fair observation as well. So theory says, and I can't remember the, the name of the academic that came up with this, but theory says that it's 100 people. And essentially, when you get to 100, and the reason why it's 100 people is because you can only know on a kind of, you know, personal level, 100 people before you, you know, you start not knowing who people are in the organisation. And I think particularly in digital organisation, that's where it gets quite difficult. Um, so 100 is, is the kind of the academic baseline. I'll let you know as we get bigger, because we're getting bigger all the time when we hit that, that point. But the theory is on that then, once you hit that kind of 100, you almost need to create another cluster somewhere else, so you create two separate organisms. Um, you could probably extend that into some sort of biological concepts, I imagine, but I won't try because I wasn't very good in biology. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you, you could be right. We've certainly, I think, going over the 15 mark, we felt a bit of creaking. And we, you know, we started having requests for more formal policies and procedures and things. So I think you've got to evolve with it as you go. And I think it will depend on the types of individuals you have in the organisation um, as well. Uh, but yeah, there is a limit. And it's a case of what do you do when you hit that limit? You can evolve it so far and then you probably need to break off. And again, that's the, the kind of benefit with the entrepreneurial way of working is that you just pull together a team from your existing team and send them off to go and do something different. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's a really kind of agile, flexible way of working. Thank you. Brilliant. Well, it's time for tea break now. So again, thanks very much, Jess. Can we show our appreciation for Jess one more time, please?